I'll give you a quick uh, idea of the format tonight. It's uh, actually divided into two sections. First, we will be talking to the two candidates for select board. And then at approximately 7.30, we'll be speaking to the, uh, the gentlemen that are running for the uh, budget committee. Uh, there will be opening statements and then uh, questions, which we will rotate so that everybody gets a shot at uh, the first answer. Uh, the time for each of these will be approximately two minutes. And uh, then we will have closing statements. And a reminder to everyone that the forum is being recorded, so it becomes a matter of public record. And it will be rebroadcast on Yankee Cable Network on Sunday, March 1st at 12 and 6. So I'd like to welcome Colin Beasley and Bill Helm who are running for select board. And are you ready for your first question? Well, I will start with Colin. Okay, great, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, first, thank you to the uh, League of Women Voters for the opportunity and thank you to all those attending and watching. Uh, so what am I for? First and foremost, I'm for maintaining our small town charm. It certainly is one of those things that we uh, love about this town. Uh, like many in the town, I support land conservation. I also support affordable housing, including workforce housing, and for the safety and well-being of our police and fire personnel. And I want to ensure we are appropriately maintaining and modernizing our facilities. I'm also going to vote for the school budget. Where I differ is in my views as to how to govern. On that matter, as your selectman, I will be keenly focused on listening to our citizens as they have expressed themselves in our master plan carrying out that plan and linking, linking it to the budget. I believe we need to be accountable to the public for plan execution and bringing projects in, uh, to their completion. Uh, increasing, I'm sorry, including and relying on the input of our dedicated uh, residents on our, committee, on our committees and commissions. I think it's critical that we leverage their expertise uh, in our decision process. Uh, bringing our community together to solve our challenges. After all, we are a community and we need to listen to and learn from each other. Ensuring comprehensive plans are developed and supported by data, including budget and tax impacts. You deserve that information. Being concerned for all of our taxpayers, balancing budget cost increases with cost management and exploring additional sources of revenue. Defining our needs first, before any building investment, before purchasing any land, before any new construction or renovation, we should determine the full cost and the best way forward with the input and advice from all the appropriate committees. Finally, advocating for and celebrating the work of our employees and volunteers, both contribute immensely to the town's future. In short, I wanna make decisions about our future with you, not for you. And I thank you for uh, uh, taking the time with us tonight, and I look forward to any questions you might have. I'll hand it over to Bill. Thank you, Colin. All right, Bill, your opening statement. Okay, thank you. And I also want to thank the um, Kearsarge chapter of the League of Women Voters for uh, allowing us to have this time together and to what I gather is a fairly good-sized audience listening. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm running for selectman because I believe that the experience needed to be an effective select, that I have the experience needed to be an effective selectman at this crucial point in time in New London's history. I have a lot of experience in New London affairs, a current knowledge of important issues, and a very strong vision for the future, which are all necessary. As many of you know, I was a selectman previously from 2016 to 2019. Prior to that, for three years, I was chairman of the planning board. And prior to that, I served for a year as a, on the budget committee. Also, as many of you know, from 2002 to 2012, I was heavily involved as chairman of the New London Hospital during a critical period of time in the history of that institution. And that leadership experience also helped me in my experience with the town. My leadership style can also be summarized as the following. I'm a very effective listener who respects all points of view. I'm a forward thinker who looks to the future while celebrating the past and living in the here and now. And I'm a decisive decision maker who looks at both quantitative and qualitative information when making decisions. I look forward to this opportunity to respond to your questions tonight. 
Thank you. All right, thank you both. Uh, they say we had a lot of questions come in. So let's start the first question with uh, Colin. What is the most important thing you learned from your service on other town boards and committees? Um, well, the first most important thing I learned is that uh, the amount of dedicated people in this town that are willing to volunteer their expertise and capabilities was astounding. Um, the second thing that I learned is, is focused on uh, bringing things to closure. And uh, I have learned along the way that there are some things in the town that were not brought to closure uh, when they were identified. So for example, uh, there was something identified back in 2015 in the um, capital improvement plan around uh, the need for storage. Um, here we are in 2022 and nothing's been done about it. So I moved to get some monies uh, reinstated in the budget to make sure that we can make progress in that area. We had started an activity. Um, but I would say the most important thing that I learned is really goes back to uh, the town people. I mean, they're just phenomenal. They want to be involved. Um, the building facilities committee that I'm involved in uh, is quite a mix of folks and their expertise and capabilities. I think it brought our understanding of what is around, uh, what, uh, what issues are confronting us as a town for uh, very significant assets whose replacement values are in the millions and millions of dollars. And our need to continue thinking through how we maintain those. Uh, is something that really has uh, caught my interest. Uh, and then over the past year on the budget committee, um, one of the things that I learned that I think is very important is I need to rethink the process. We wait until the end to take a look at the tax impact. I think we need to start thinking through some forecasted information at the front of the budget process so that we can appreciate what the possible tax implications are of the submitted budgets. Uh, and that should change how we ask our questions uh, and how we position our budget going forward. And I will leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, Bill, most important thing you learned from your service on town boards and Well, I guess if I may, I'd like to suggest uh, two things. First of all, um, in my experience over 20 plus years here in New London and a decade before that in uh, Massachusetts and working in um, not-for-profit and particularly government types of roles, I've learned very strongly that Government is not business, and we have to adapt a different attitude about what we do when we're dealing with government than we do in business. I've had a career as a businessman, and I've had to set aside a lot of my uh, thoughts and ways of doing business work in, in favor of what is more of a consensus building process in, in government work. Certainly here in New London, we've learned that it takes sometimes years in order to accomplish things by the time all of the different constituencies have had their opportunity um, to participate. So I think that this long experience in working in the government field will uh, carry me in good stead again as another term as a selectman. This, the second thing is that uh, as a selectman, we're not running the town. As a selectman, we're the executives of the town, but we hire competent town administrators and department heads to do that work. And we should not interfere with their work as long as that's being done properly. So uh, it's experience in government and, re and not, not thinking that we can do it ourselves. Thank you. All right, second question, we'll start with you, Bill. Uh, what is your plan for New London for the next five years or 10 years? What needs do you foresee and how will you meet them? Okay, well, thank you very much for, for that question. I sort of think in sort of shorter, shorter terms, 10 years seems like a long, long way out to plan. So I think maybe in terms of a three-year plan for the term that I might uh, be on the board of selectmen uh, again. And in that period of time, it seems to me that what we need to do is to put to closure the police site uh, uh, issue that has been going on since I was on the committee before. In um, 2018, the uh, board of selectmen in their report to the town said that they were ready to go in terms of uh, uh, looking for a new site for the police department had, and had concluded because of the uh, results of the study that the Harriman group did for us that the current site for the police department was uh, inappropriate and that a new site needed to be found. Now, um, as Colin has suggested, you know, nothing has happened and here we are still studying the issue of where we might put a, a police station and we haven't even gotten to the point of, uh, of designing it. So the police site issue is of paramount importance to me. And second of all, I firmly believe that in the course of the next three years, 
we need to do something to uh, have more affordable housing in this, this town. We can do that both through more accessory dwelling units, and we can do that by uh, taking advantage of uh, property that becomes available and supporting developers who uh, want to put affordable housing on that property, particularly the uh, 40 acres of Crescenti land along County Road. So I think those two are, those are the two big pictures, but we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that the things that go on day in and day out that we have to uh, make sure are being uh, performed to our satisfaction while we look at these big issues also. So thank you. Okay, Colin, we're gonna start with you for question number three. This is- uh, Should I answer both? that question? No. Uh, Colin was Colin didn't get to go. Oh, that I one, yeah. apologize. The five, okay. or ten, five or ten year plan you didn't get to. Well. That's fine. Yeah. No. Uh, so listen, I my view is um, uh, the five to ten year plan was uh, is already in front of us. It's called the master plan, uh, and the community uh, spent a lot of time and resources putting that together. Uh, and so, uh, I as as a select board member, I would ensure that we were focusing on that master plan according to the priorities as defined by the citizens. Uh, and yes, in that master plan, uh, Bill's right, the police department is in there and that work is underway. Uh, the uh, affordable housing, including workforce housing is addressed in that plan. Uh, I think we should rely on the housing commission to give us guidance for that. Um, I do think that uh, one of the things that Bill had talked about in the previous question, but it's applicable here is, I think the select board has a responsibility for oversight uh, and they are accountable. Uh, so while we don't go in and manage the day-to-day -day business, I do believe that we're accountable to the taxpayer, that we should be spending our time understanding what the citizens want, and they've done that in the master plan. They've provided us with priorities in the master plan, and I think that we need to provide some oversight to the community with the input of all the uh, commissions and committees to move that directionally forward, uh, and, and there's no reason to focus on one or the other. I think we need to focus on all of them. And, and Bill's right, I think we also need to focus on just uh, optimizing the current operation. And what I mean by that is we need to keep it running. There's maintenance requirements that have uh, been identified. There's gonna be modernization requirements that have been identified and the select board should be driving all those uh, variables through the uh, town employees and frankly, the committees and the commissions that people volunteer for. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Question number three, we start with uh, Colin this time. This is from a voter and I'm gonna quote it directly. This is a quote. I have witnessed recent uh, divisions and disagreements among the select board, the building and facilities committee, as well as town voters concerning the police station, land purchase for future needs, et cetera. If elected, what will you do to build consensus and improve civility? Uh, so I, I do believe this, uh, the, the committees and the commissions in the town um, are a venue for the select board to get informed about the issues and informed about how to approach um, the challenge that are in front of us. With respect to the police station, Bill's right, that work has been going on for a while. But what's critical is that we don't have all the details. So we have a subcommittee underneath the Buildings and Facilities Committee. Uh, one of the things that we did uh, as chair of the BFC is I invited uh, the police chief to join that subcommittee and she's in fact heading it. Uh, we've invited another police officer, uh, uh, Lieutenant Keith, who is a resident of the town. And we reached out to another, organ another uh, committee, the planning board to bring somebody on. So I think one of the ways to, to bridge the gap between people is to include them. Inclusivity is important. And I think that for the select board to continue to bring uh, other organizations and committees and volunteers into the debate and the discussion, uh, will allow us to get a better view of things and hopefully uh, people can begin to communicate and, and think through and come to the compromises that are necessary. Uh, I think the only way to get to the bottom of an issue is discussion, facts, data, uh, and ultimately the select board will have to make that decision, but they should be informed by all those conversations. Hopefully, uh, if the citizens see that sort of behavior play out, uh, that uh, we can all put aside our of views as to what we really believe is necessary and think through the compromises that will allow us to move forward. Thank you, Bill. How do we increase consensus and build civility? Well, thank you uh, for that question again. Also, um, 
I, I think that the major issue of, of, of dissension and uh, civility has occurred at the, at the selectman board itself, as opposed to other parts of the town. I don't see in the planning board and the budget committee and the housing commission and the uh, building and facilities committee, for example, the same division that ex appears to exist with the board of selectmen. And my answer to that question is very simple. In the three years that I was on the board of selectmen with two of the three current members of the board, uh, we got along reasonably well most of the time. And when we weren't in, in accord with each other, we talked it out and we figured out uh, what to do. Now, I don't believe that, that John Cannon's responsible for the fact that there isn't as much uh, civility and agreement on the board today as there were three years ago. The part of the problem has been that the society we live in has become more contentious. Uh, certainly the COVID uh, uh, pandemic has created problems also. But, but I believe that part of the reason that we were successful in the three years that I was on the board of selectmen was because of the leadership that I personally provided in trying to uh, continue to bridge the differences uh, with my two colleagues. And we uh, accomplished a lot during that period of time. Uh, Colin may say there's a lot of un undone business, but I again would return to the notion that it takes a long time to accomplish things in, in government because you do have to bring all of the committees and individuals um, to bear. So that simply, I would say that uh, my leadership back on the board of selectmen would help deal with that issue to a great degree. Uh, we're going to start this question with Bill. This is number four. What steps would you take to address town infrastructure needs and how would you prioritize these needs? And they are mentioning specifically uh, recreation, uh, trash, lighting, roads, and uh, other infrastructure needs. So I gather the, the questioner here is not talking about the uh, uh, maintenance of buildings and so on and maintenance of the roads and the, the current infrastructure. It sounds like they're asking about um, uh, infrastructure that doesn't exist, at least in the case of, of recreation um, and in the transfer station. Uh, the, uh, that may be a question about current infrastructure. I would say in terms of, of recreation that my position uh, during my previous time on the Board of Selectmen and, and ever since has been that we do need to work with the outing club. We have a very strong recreation group in this town, and we need to continue to find a way to merge the town's recreation interests with those of the outing club. And I think that's, again, possible, and I believe as progress is being made in that area, but it's taken many years, and it may take more years. As far as the transfer station is concerned, I believe that there are several relatively modest things that could be done. The Building and Facilities Committee has uh, listed them, and I believe Colin can talk to them, that are in fact worth doing in order to separate more of the uh, renew uh, the re uh, recyclables and to make the traffic patterns easier. But I believe we need to stay at the existing site and that uh, otherwise the transfer station uh, could be made to work fairly easily. I think those were the two items, <clears throat> excuse me, the two items I heard was recreation and transfer station. Yeah, so uh, I, I'm good. So I, I, I Bill and I are in agreement. Um, I would tell you that uh, the Bill and Facilities Committee has done uh, quite a bit of work with Bob Harrington uh, and uh, identified all of his needs. Um, there's definitely an opportunity to get more efficient how we deal with recyclables and that plan uh, is in place. It needs to be executed. Uh, Bob is working with uh, a subset of the Bill and Facilities Committee team to do that. Uh, as it relates to recreation, I 100% agree uh, that uh, we should be leveraging the outing club. I think there's an opportunity there. Uh, and I think that we should, as a town, embrace that and work through whatever uh, relationships are necessary uh, to further that activity. And I'll, I'll leave it at that so that we can go on to another question and, and try to get some more questions handled. Okay, great, thank you. All right, uh, we are now starting with you, Colin. Uh, and this question has been posed for both Selectmen and uh, the Budget Committee. Town is currently reassessing properties. Do you support decreasing the property tax rate by the same percentage as the value of assessed properties increase? So listen, I, I, um, I think that we, no matter what the story is, I think that there needs to be a thorough review of the budget every single year. 
Uh, I do not believe that the opportunity for a tax reassessment that would look at make it appear that our taxes are down because the tax rate gets adjusted as a function of the assessment going up uh, is the appropriate uh, thought process. I think that as if we go through a tax assessment and uh, those uh, rates go up, I'm sorry, those uh, values go up and the rates go down, we need to translate that into what's the dollar cost impact per citizen category. And I think it's gonna be important for us to understand that because the next step will be what's the implication of a, a budget on those citizens? And so uh, it's not a simple answer, uh, but I do, I do not believe that we should be hiding behind um, the verbiage that says, well, our, your tax rate went down, when in fact, the reason for that tax rate decline is a function of assessments. And I think what we need to do is begin to talk in the budget point of view of, what is the budget asking for tax dollars raised? And what does that mean to your bill? So this year, our taxes are going up uh, over 10%. The tax rate's about eight, eight or 9%. Um, I know Bill's in, Bill in his documentation in one of his earlier ads had talked about his tax rate going down by 5%. In fact, the year they went down by 5% was one of the tax assessment issues. The amount of dollars that had to be raised for the budget under his tenure actually went up. And that's typically the case for all the budgets. So that's why I'm talking about our need to deal with some cost management as we think through the budget implications. <clears throat> and we need to work collaboratively with our department heads to look for creative ways to manage our future budgets so it's not a constant increase. And that's what it's been. We're sitting here at a budget now at 33% than it was higher than it was in 2019. Uh, and if we continue at this rate, uh, by 2026 or there or thereabouts, we would have moved from a 20, I'm sorry, a $7 million budget in 2019 to a $14 million in 2026. In a short matter of eight years, nine years, this town will have doubled their budget based on the way we're doing things today. I'm not suggesting that we manage the town. Or I am suggesting that we provide some oversight. We collaborate with the leaders of this town and we look for ways to manage our budget. Thank you. Well, Colin's put a lot of different things into an answer to uh, uh, one question there. But as far as the increase in assessed value and how that should affect the tax rate, it's a very complicated matter because assessments don't go up evenly. Uh, tax rates don't go down evenly. A large property on the lake will undoubtedly be assessed at a much greater value in this reassessment. And uh, uh, condominiums at Hilltop will probably be assessed less and that's the, the starting point uh colin just uh went into a lot of so it's not really that, that relationship that the questioner asked for is that's too too that's the answer is much more complicated than that i don't think tonight we want to go into a lot of numbers but i i would simply say i would dispute a number of the things that colin just finished saying about the um the budget because the the budget has the operating expenses it has the capital reserves it has debt issues involved in it and so on. And so you know, there's a lot we could all do with, uh, with, with numbers and so on. And I, without spending the evening uh, debating each other's numbers, I would simply say it's a lot more difficult than uh, Colin just suggested, because I, I don't think this is a night to be taking each other apart. I think we should be trying to answer uh, the voters' questions. All right, we're going into a few questions now about uh, housing and workforce housing. We're starting with Bill. Do you fully support efforts to provide workforce housing? And if so, what are the steps necessary to take? What complications is there in planning? And what town committees would you consult? Thank you. This is a, an issue that's near and dear to my heart. First and foremost, let's make it clear that the planning board is the first place that most activity has to take place. And for those, those people that are listening, I think you know the planning board is a board appointed by the uh, board of selectmen. Um, and so generally speaking, the people on it serve fairly long terms. The planning board did an excellent job in the last couple of years of easing the requirements for accessory dwelling units, which I mentioned in my opening statement. An accessory dwelling unit is simply a uh, ability to add an apartment or some sort of structure to an existing house so there's a second dwelling unit 
on the same uh, piece of land. And I think that has been helpful in some instances to provide more housing. But the big question of um, large scale affordable housing has to do with zoning. And the first step in that, uh, the planning board has proposed a zoning amendment that's on the ballot for uh, March, uh, March 8th. And that, that question is to reduce the density requirement on commercial land. If that is done and a developer comes to town and is willing to build on the commercial land of the Crescenti property, we can put perhaps 60 uh, workforce housing units on that seven acre parcel of land right there with the proposed zoning that's being made. Additional changes in zoning would require would have to be made to make it easier to put workforce housing on other parts of the uh, town. But I think that's an excellent place to start. And I applaud the planning board, both their accessory dwelling unit work and for their proposed change in zoning on commercial land. Alan? Uh, so I, I do, I, I do agree that the planning board has a role, but I think that the Housing Commission has a, a very significant role here as well. Uh, I think that there's experts on the Housing Commission that are trying to understand uh, the full breadth of all the issues associated with affordable housing. Uh, and uh, their insight uh, should be something that informs the planning board and the selectmen uh, as to the steps that we need to take. I was at a meet and greet this past weekend, uh, and the, one of the conversations we talked about was uh, the zoning rules. And um, I learned some things. And I think that it's not so simple as uh, doing zoning changes. Uh, this is a very complicated area. Uh, the state has laws that are, that are pressing forward. We have to really think through what it means to the character of the town. So for example, uh, in my view, putting all the affordable housing in one location, particularly at the Crescenti uh, lot, I don't think that that's good for our town character. Uh, to suggest that the affordable housing is going to look at the back end of a retail uh, mall, in my view, is not uh, who we are. I think what we need to do is think through with the, uh, with the planning board and with the housing commission uh, how we bring affordable housing in. Is it in one location or is it in multiple locations? Um, it's really important for us to think all, through all those issues and understand what the implications are for land acquisition, developers having the monies in the, in the sense of to build the buildings, how does the affordable housing actually stay affordable after they've been built, and what are the rules and criteria around that? Uh, so I think there's a multitude of groups that have to be involved in this thing, and, and I think that uh, between the planning board, the selectmen, and the housing commission, that would be the start, and we need to all get our understanding of those variables before we move forward. But we need to move forward. Okay, thank you, Colin. We start with this question. Uh, and I think people are making a distinction between workforce housing and affordable housing. Uh, this question is, how should the town deal with the current housing shortage? Yeah, I, I, I don't know how I would answer that other than what I have. I mean, clearly, uh, the housing shortage, if they're talking about a housing shortage uh, and talking about the affordability of that housing, uh, that's, talking, that's going back to what I talked about. It, having... Having, having the ability to understand the rules and regulations and deciding uh, how we would in, incent developers to build homes that are affordable so that folks can buy them, and then having the rules and regulations wrapped around those incentives such that they stay affordable as opposed to someone going in, buying it, turning around a year from now and selling it, and they become unaffordable over time. So all these variables are very interconnected. And that's why I think it's gonna be important for having a concerted effort between the planning board, the planning board, the housing commission and the selectmen to think through those interconnectedness and, and move. Uh, it's gonna be a set of policies overlaid by what our laws are gonna require of us, move the town forward to, to, to adopt the right policies. And it goes beyond just zoning uh, to make sure that we can get some affordable housing in town. I agree that there's a lot of um, misunderstanding about the difference between affordable housing and um, workforce housing. And I think to clarify that issue first, that most people in town are talking about, as I've said in some of my um, communications in the media, about housing for the type of housing that employees of 
that work in the town, whether they work at the college or the hospital or in the businesses in town or even in the uh, town departments. We're, we're not talking about affordable housing of the type that uh, gets us uh, uh, snap a uh, small uh, me media attention on WMER and, and the news. And so we're talking about so-called professional housing or housing for employees of the of the town or their and their and their families. Um, I, I agree, Colin, that the Housing Commission has a role here too, and I didn't mean to leave them out in my previous uh, statement. I think the Housing Commission's major role is to help educate all of us, or at least all those who uh, want to be educated about this. But but ultimately, it's the, the statutorily, it's the planning board that has the key role um, here when it, when push comes to to show, and so I, they have to work together and I hope the Housing Commission will be able to educate us and there's some excellent people on that uh, particular board. As far as the Crescenti property is, is concerned, which is getting a lot of uh, attention at this point, um, the, the, the issue is that it's the backside of a shopping center. Any good developer will know how to screen and develop the site in a way that uh, doesn't make it look like it's the back of a shopping center, but there is the key issue we have to be able to uh, have the, enough incentives in place, and one of them is the water and sewer uh, availability, to make it attractive for a developer to come into New London. Our land costs are extraordinarily high, and that's why this particular property is pretty unique. Most landowners are not going to just give their land away, and land is a precious commodity in this town, so we have to look to the places where we might be able to do something that's affordable, it has lot of water and sewer and so on. And those of us that are in the real estate business know that first and foremost, you have to be able to get control of that property or else the rest of it is just a lot of conversation. Thank you. Thank you. And one more question on housing and uh, we start with Bill. Please share your thoughts on how, where, and for which demographic affordable housing should be developed. Okay, I think that's just a continuation of the uh, previous uh, uh, discussion. One form of affordable housing that we haven't talked about is affordable housing for empty nesters and retirees. And this is where I think the um, uh, accessory dwelling units has begin to, begun to make uh, a move that people can move it who don't want to live in a place like uh, Hilltop or uh, Highland Ridge or perhaps the new New London place that's being developed behind the hospital uh, might find that simply having a a uh, small unit attached to an existing house somewhere in town would make, make sense. Um, so that would be more for the empty nester and the um, uh, retiree. Uh, I think we've already covered the question of affordable, so-called affordable housing for employees and so on. And it's, it's for people who have good work and can uh, just want a place to live in town that doesn't cost five, six, seven hundred thousand dollars $700,000 at a minimum. Uh, let me just uh, run that one again. How, sure. where, no, I, and for I'm which good. demographic? I'm good, yeah. So the demographics are um, obviously uh, new families, uh, young folks who are uh, wanting to live here, um, perhaps starting a family or just starting their career. Um, folks who have been here for years uh, and they want to get uh, downsized and get into a smaller location so they have a tendency to be the older folks. Um, uh, folks who are working uh, here that uh, have families, the, de the, demogra the demographics are mixed. The commonality of all those demographics typically have, associ have associated with them income levels uh, and their ability to afford expensive housing here in town. Uh, and Bill's right, I think to, to rehash all that, the real issue is um, how do we work through uh, mixed housing uh, and zoning laws that will uh, enable um, and perhaps incent, you know, zoning laws want to incent, but in, at least enable uh, the availability of housing in locations that they are not, not necessarily there now. Uh, but again, it's going to be complicated. And I think that we need to think through and work with developers to understand what their variables are, uh, what, what's going to incent them. We have to work with the state who's going to make monies available. Uh, most recently, they just um, announced that they're going to make $100 million available to the, to the various towns. I don't know all the details of that, but this is a mushrooming issue inside the state of New Hampshire. And I think we need to connect those dots 
and hopefully make progress across all those demographics. All right, this is uh, going to have to be the uh, the final question. We're going to start with uh, Colin, and then we'll give you a chance for your closing statements. Uh, this is for those gallant folks who get up at 7.30 on Saturday morning to attend the Citizen Advisory Committee. Do you believe the CAC is an important connection to the citizens of New London, and what role will the CAC play in your thinking and decision-making? Uh, yes, oh. I do. I, I mean, the bottom line is, I'm in favor of committees. I think they are uh, a venue for the selectmen to garner uh, information, garner opinions. I think for every committee, there's each one of those people have their sets of friends and their sets of colleagues. It becomes a tentacle of information uh, into the communication flow. I think the CAC is very, very important. Um, I frankly, I would create another committee. I would. I, I think we need to think about economic development in the town. And we need to get experts in the town who can focus our conversation around how we get economic development and grow revenues. And the, in, the, in my view, the Citizens Advisory Committee is sort of the signing board for all these committees. You know, there, is, there are experts who are providing us guidance and information and the Citizens Advisory Committee is gonna, is gonna be that venue that can say, here's what we think about it all. Uh, they can get educated and they can provide feedback. And, and frankly, I think the selectmen need to start connecting the dots connecting the dots between the committees, having the committees coming in front of the selectmen and getting the committees to sit in front of the CAC. They had a meeting uh, last month and uh, they had the housing commission there. Lots of good conversation, lots of information going back and forth. And I think the CAC members, I know I got educated and I think they got educated. So it allows that activity to just kind of swirl around in our heads and in other people's heads so that we get a more informed um, town. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Bill. I, I totally support the Citizens Advisory Committee. I wish that it was a, had a larger number of people in it and uh, that represented more demographic, more of the demographic differences in town. It tends to be, uh, uh, st uh, have a group of people on it who are somewhat older demographic or we're missing the younger demographic. Maybe it's because Saturday mornings is the wrong time to meet because that's when sports events and family events are going on because the younger families have got their children and they're trying to figure out how to, to squash uh, 10 activities into two, two days. But yes, the Citizens Advisory Committee is an important element of how uh, we have a dialogue in this town. I actually disagree with uh, Colin on the uh, Economic uh, Advisory Committee. You know, I, I think, as I said earlier, this is a government body we have here in town. Um, our principal source of revenue is going to continue to be taxes and motor vehicle registrations, prin principally taxes. That's what governments are all about. That's how they get their money. They get it from uh, taxation. And in the state of Mass uh, New Hampshire, the only form of taxation that is permitted is property taxes for all intents and purposes. And so we have to keep looking to those taxes and figure out how to best manage what we can get from property taxes in this town to both meet the needs of the town and uh, the current needs of the town and address uh, future investments in the town. Um, we're not going to, in my hum humble opinion, uh, make build big uh, commercial uh, activities on the exits of uh, the highway 11 and exits 11 and 12 as Warner has done. Warner has pointed out as an example that has a, a commercial tax base. That's just not New London. Uh, I agree with Colin, we want to keep this as a small New England community. So let's face it, it's a residential community and we're going to base it on property taxes. Thank you. I want to thank both you gentlemen for your uh, uh, comments tonight. And we will have a two minute closing statements beginning with Colin. I think it was going to begin with me to be fair to Colin. Oh, all right, Bill. Is that right, Colin? That's right, Colin. Colin is correct. I'm going to give it to Bill. Go ahead. Okay. So I, I just simply want to ask everybody who's listening to this tonight for their careful consideration of my leadership and experience in New London volunteer activities. And incidentally, as I said before, even before my 22 years here, I think I've made major contributions to this town over the past 22 years, and I want to continue to do that. And I think as we look forward in the uh, decade ahead, I would also emphasize the need to constantly cultivate uh, 
uh, the, the positive in this wonderful community of ours. We touched on that a bit in one of the, the questions, but I, I think basically this is a community that wants to be positive, even as we try to craft compromises to our various positions and opinions. Um, I wanna thank you for the opportunity to continue to serve our town. And I hope that our occasional disagreements can be viewed as minor in the context of the greater global issues around us, such as the war that we've started, uh, it's been started in Europe today and the longer term issues of, of climate change and similar things. So thank you, Pat, for uh, your uh, moderating of this and uh, thank the League of Women Voters again for letting us have this opportunity and thanks to all the people that are listening. I hope you will vote for me. Thank you. Okay, uh, you know, recently I've been reading a book, uh, actually uh, walking through it for the second time called Our Voices, Our Town by Ian Page Stecker. It's a history of New London, I think from 1948 to 2000. Um, you know, the town of London has been at the crossroads in the past. The very thought of zoning in Route 89, are two examples uh, that generated enormous energy and discussion within the town. And I cite this because, uh, you know, we've had some fairly um, energetic and passionate discussions in this town over the last year. And I agree with Bill, that's very important. We have to have those conversations. People's opinions have to be um, uh, heard and, and they should be listened to. Uh, and we need that to continue. I believe we're at an inflection point right now in this town in two areas. Uh, first, uh, how we wanna govern the town. I'm an advocate of collaboration leveraging the expertise of the volunteers and employees to inform our decisions. I think we need to continue pressing that, filling our, our committees and commissions with experts, uh, inviting them into the select board meetings more often than they are now, engaging them in good discussion and good debate and collectively learn about what's in front of us and how we act on them. The second area that I think is very important that for us to focus on uh, is how we wanna to manage the town's growth. And for that, I'm an advocate of developing detailed plans, fully vetting the needs versus the wants and sharing with the public the full cost of those plans, including their impact on taxes. I'm a believer in bottoms up, not top down. I'm a believer that the bottom up uh, assessment and inclusion of people in the town will engage the town, educate the town and help everyone understand what's in front of us and they become more accepting of it to the extent that it does increase our taxes. I'm not an anti-tax person. I think it's important that what we do when we present to the citizens uh, an initiative that's gonna cause their taxes to go up, that we can answer the question, why? You know, I think we have a very unique New England small town charm. It's a nice sense of place. And in my view, uh, we need to continue advocating all the policies that help us maintain that sense of place. And we need to manage our needs into the future with that in our mind. So I'll leave it at that. I just wanna say thank you for your consideration. Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, I appreciate your vote. Uh, and tomorrow, please be careful. It's gonna be a pretty bad day. Thank you. Hi, thank you. That concludes the select board section of our uh, candidates forum. We're now going to switch over to the six candidates for the budget committee. All right, these gentlemen are all running for seats on the budget committee. And uh, we're going to follow the same rules, uh, two minute opening statement and then questions uh, asked in uh, rotation. And uh, looks like you're uh, all up there alphabetically already. So that's good. All right, so Lou, would you like to begin with your opening statement? Lou, is your uh, audio on? It's still muted, Lou. On mute. Okay, here we, here we go. Well, thank you very much. I really, I thank the uh, League of Women's Voters, the, um, <clears throat> the the people of New Hampshire, the people of the uh, of New London. Uh, I'm Lou Bowden. I'm running for the position of member of the Budget Committee in New London because um, I want to maintain and improve our quality of life, and much of it revolves around how and where we spend our funds. Uh, since moving to New London, I've been involved in our town civic life and will continue to do so. Um, I'm the current, uh, the emergency management director for the town. I'm a past president of the Rotary Club and, uh, you know, served also as a former volunteer ambassador at Mount Sunapee. I served in the 
um, from my experience, I served in the Arlington County, Virginia, Financial Affairs Advisory Committee for four years, uh, which was scrubbing and overseeing what was then a $900 million county budget. And it was an appointed volunteer position similar to a budget structure in London. And I want to bring that experience to benefit our town. I'm a retired military officer, as a, you know, a 22 years in the U.S. Air Force, both in pilot and plans and programs at the Pentagon requiring extensive budgetary work. I served in the Federal Emergency Management Agency and the Department of Homeland Security as a federal coordinating officer representing the president in directed federal disasters, managing operational budgets that exceeded often a billion dollars. And what I believe is the town is not only structures and buildings and workers, the town has a soul, a vibe, a personality. Um, New London has an immense heart, a very compassionate population. A, uh, we do care as a people, and the result has been an enviable quality of life, an extremely low crime rate, a relatively low tax burden and a very happy community. And I want to maintain it as one of the best places to live ever. But the budget committee is a key part of the community life and I wanna make it better. Uh, I believe in the competence of our appointed leaders. I believe that we can make our town better by transparency, dedication and maintaining the civil nature of our government. I also believe that we must look to the future while grinding ourselves in the present. And we do that by respecting already crafted plans and at the same time, listen to and be responsive to our people. And, and, um, and that's me, that's, that's uh, I wanna help this town. Thank you. Thank you, Lou. Okay, Mr. Cannon. John, you wanna give an opening statement? I do. Okay. So good evening, everyone. And uh, I want to thank the League of Women Voters as well for their um, work and support in uh, providing this valuable um, program. This is, uh, and, and given the situations today with uh, meetings, and this is, a, I guess this is the best alternative. Um, so I'm very grateful for that. So um, as you know, I'm on the, uh, currently on the Board of Selectmen, but I've chose not to uh, run again. And I've been coming to this area for, um, over 30 years and it was became very excited to move here after um, meeting my wife, Sally, and retiring after 30 years in the 30-year uh, career in the Portland Fire Department. Um, so I've enjoyed working, um, serving on the Board of Selectmen. And while I was on the board, um, I served on the Budget Committee for all three years. So having worked in government at uh, for over 40 years at local, state, and federal levels, um, one thing I learned is that um, that the budget does become the uh, the policy and the direction for the for a town, and also from my experience in the government, I have a really good sense of what works and what doesn't work. So it is this um, experience and knowledge that is why I want to continue to serve on the uh, the budget committee, and um, working in that committee um, format is as a selectman I you quickly learn that no matter what you want to do or what you want to implement or adopt, that no matter what you can't, you still need to at least two votes uh, to get it, get it done. So you have to um, collaborate and compromise and cooperate. And, and ultimately that's how uh, we get things done. So it is with this um, sense of cooperation and, and collaboration and experience that uh, I feel I would be a very um, valuable member to the budget committee and also provide some continuity of being on one side of the budget committee, you know, budget process, and then moving that to the, uh, uh, bringing that to the budget committee. So that's why I would uh, want to serve. So thank you. Thank you. Mark Christensen. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, allow myself to introduce myself to, to everyone. Um, let's see, just a, a quick bio. Um, my name is Mark Christensen. I've lived in town for 20 years uh, with my wife, and my son is in eighth grade, uh, looking forward to going to the, to the high school next year. Um, 
for the last 20 years, I've uh, served the community. I've uh, been a coach for the Outing Club for 13 plus years, uh, served on that board. Um, I was elected to uh, the school board from our town and um, I did serve on the budget committee. Um, and so I think uh, it's very important for the budget committee to have uh, voices from all parts of our community. Um, and so uh, when I look at the next three years, uh, I'm really interested in making sure that uh, we lock down the police department site and get that rolling. Uh, I feel like that's kind of been kicked down the road <laughs> many, many times. Um, and I'm also uh, interested in workforce housing, but I think we need to be aware of the process. And the first step in that process is, uh, is getting the land. And so we need to be conscientious of where that land is and how much is that going, how much is that going to impact our budget? Um, and so that's it real quick. Uh, thank you very much for the time. Charles Kelsey. Oh, thank you and good evening, everyone. Um, <clears throat> I'm uh, part of the fourth generation of Kelsey's living in New London, <clears throat> now living in New London. Um, so they have a kind of a long history um, and have 43 years or so of management experience, <clears throat> um, principally in the healthcare industry. Um, and during that time held several uh, senior management positions in companies like Saga Corporation, Marriott, Sodexo, Unidyne, a small, very successful consulting firm, which I co-founded called Schoolhouse Solutions, um, and ultimately ended my career uh, three years ago working at uh, Riverwoods at Exeter, which is a retirement community, uh, and was essentially their primary operations officer. Um, subsequently retired here to New London and live here with my wife, Cynthia. We have three great kids, all not living in New London. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I've been an observer, not a participant in the process of uh, government of town or frankly, a lot of activities. I've had some board experience. Um, I was the president of the board for Kern Hatton Homes. I've served on that board for 25 years. It's a, a school and residence for at-risk children in Vermont. I also uh, serve presently on the board of the Kirsarish Food Hub, which is working on food sovereignty for our region um, and enjoy that very much. Um, my experience financially is primarily based from having developed operating budgets for large uh, enterprises in hospitals and also in corporations that provided management services to those hospitals and other healthcare facilities like nursing homes and retirement communities. Um, my schooling has been that of uh, philosophy of zero-based budgeting, which essentially says working budgets from the base up with logical quantified assumptions, uh, as opposed to a process of saying last year's budget was X and the expenses were Y, therefore inflation's X and the CPI is Y, so we should increase it by that amount. So that's my budget philosophy and I would hope to bring the experience uh, to, the, to the committee with that in mind, along with hard work. Okay, thank you. Uh, Michael Williams. Michael, you got your audio on? I'm on now. Okay, I, uh, I'm Michael Williams. Um, my professional background is in uh, information systems. I was a application development, application independent application developer for half my career. The other half I was a um, technology manager, um, senior technical manager at Bank of America, and later at Southern New Hampshire University. Um, I'm a New London native. I was born in New London. Um, my grandmother was born in New London. My mother was born in Franklin, but she lived, spent her whole life here. Uh, my dad grew up here. I have relatives from back to the revolution buried on Old Main Street. So I'm, I have deep, deep roots in, in New London, uh, just New Hampshire. Um, and with that comes a real sense of responsibility for the legacy. Um, I'm 
I volunteered as a town's uh, information technology officer. That was my background, and there's clearly a need. Um, I have served uh, my one term is on the budget committee, and I'd like to do that again. And other than that, I, I don't have a um, agenda other than um, preserving, you know, the, the beautiful town that we have that, um, you know, my ancestors provided for me, and, and I want to continue that. Uh, John Wilson. Uh, thank you. Good evening. Uh, and thank you to the League of Women Voters for inviting me to participate in this forum. And my name is John Wilson. I have lived full time in New London for the last 51 years, where I was a practicing dentist for 32 of those years. Moving to New London was the, one of the three best decisions I've made in my life. I love this place. During my time here, I was elected to the budget committee four times, serving a total of 12 years. I was a committee chair for three of those years. Also during that time, I gained a lot of experience in town budgeting, which I would once again like to contribute to the town. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we begin the questions. As we said, we're going rotation. So John Cannon is going to uh, begin with the first question, which is, what is the most important thing you've learned from your, all your service to the, uh, the town uh, boards and committees? <laughs> Um, nobody's ever happy is one thing. No, you, you can't, um, you're always offending someone. Um, no, but uh, overall, I think that the, uh, the atmosphere in New London is that uh, people will, while they may disagree, is they ultimately they do come along and come around and understand and, you know, that's the way it is. And there's no hard feelings. We just move on. And I think that had this been some other places like some of the towns that we see nearby with all the uh, the battles among selectmen of, uh, you know, let's, let's recall them or let's uh, fire the police chief and take away his car and make him walk home and things like that. And if had that been the atmosphere, I wouldn't have uh, even decided to run, but it's, um, it's just overall people have a sense of doing the, getting the business done that we need to do. Um, not to say that there's not a lot of debate and, but also I think people are, are cautious. Uh, you know, let's just not jump into an idea because it sounds good or whatever. But, hey, let's, you know, they want to vet it and let's think and think it through. So that's probably the biggest lesson I've learned. Thank you, Mark. Mark Christensen. No, we're not hearing you. Uh, how about now? It looks like a, a so, Very good. Um, I love this question because I think um, we're all always learning. And uh, I think when I was on the budget committee, the biggest thing I learned was the importance of listening to our department heads, listening to the experts. You know, um, when I think about the, the chief of police, um, we, we put that chief in place for her expertise and her insight into what she needs to run uh, an efficient department and have a safe community. And so I think it's important for us to listen to the experts. And that's one of the biggest takeaways I had uh, serving on the budget committee. And then the, the other thing I'd like to say is through all my uh, engagement with community uh, members over the last 20 years is just the, the passion people have for this community and, uh, and the want for this community to be great. Um, and so I, I would leave it at that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Kelsey. Well, I can't answer the question directly because I have not really participated in committees uh, and I've observed a little, frankly. My um, analogy from experience would be my work at Riverwoods. We had 650 residents there, all who had an opinion on exactly how everything ought to be done. And it was an incredible experience of hearing dissenting points of view and trying to enlist a environment where they could actually be heard. Uh, because if you allow for that, I think there are, we improve the collective genius of any group. 
And um, I would hope that we support that kind of collaborative, inquisitive, and um, really sort of positive environment. And I would want any committee that I serve on to be, be functioning in that way. Thank you. Michael Williams. Michael, you got to turn yourself yep, on. There you go. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> the uh, thing, thing that I've learned um, from the budget committee and from uh, serving on the building and facilities committee was um, the depth of resources we have, um, both um, in terms of, you know, the, the town is uniquely situated, um, uh, you know, and it's, it's, you know, the tax base is what it is because of the, uh, you know, our physical resources, but the the human resources that we have available who are willing to participate in town organizations is really remarkable. And this, this panel is an example of that. This is a very, very strong budget committee. Um, I, I don't think we can go wrong with any three of these people. <laughs> it's, a, it's a real strong group. Um, that isn't, hasn't always been the case, but it, it's, um, it is now. And the strength of the people that are serving on the on the town committees is is quite remarkable, and um, I guess that's, that's the thing that I learned that surprised me the most. Thank you, and John Wilson. Uh, what I learned was, as a uh, committee member, being studiously prepared for a meeting makes it a lot more uh, meaningful and a lot more useful. Thank you very much. Our next question, we're going to start with uh, Mark Christensen. Oh, I'm sorry, we didn't get Lou. I'm sorry, Lou Boda. Oh, thank you. Um, the, you know, what I, what I view a budget committee, it's not something that is supposed to micromanage the town's budget working. Um, according to the RSA, you said it, you know, it is there to ensure accountability, to maintain and improve the transparency, but it's not to micromanage the departments who have the expertise to run this community and together with the um, citizens advisory boards can actually recommend the courses of action to the selectmen to then, trans to, to then uh, transpose it into a budget that the budget committee can look at and look for the sanity and look for the places that we can ensure accountability and, and, and cost savings, but it's not to micromanage the place. Uh, I do believe that very strongly that there is a strong difference between managing a governmental organization and a business. The business is there to make money. A government organization like, the, like our town and, and by inheritance, and, and the budget committee is there to look at the provision of, a, of services that we give to our people as the people demand those services from us. And we do that in a way that is both responsible and accountable. Uh, the, you know, Mark made a, a reference to our police chief. Uh, we have probably the best civil police relationship in, that we could ever have in a town. And, I, and I've lived in everything from South America to Thailand to, you know, to uh, Washington, D.C. We need to keep that. And we need to keep that by ensuring that the expenditures that we have are commensurate with the expertise that our people uh, demand. And the last one is to listen. Um, I've learned that listening and, and reaching consensus on, especially in budgetary items, is absolutely important. Thank you. Now we'll move on to the next question and we will begin with uh, Mark Christensen. In your opinion or observation, is there a town department that needs significantly more funding or more staff and why? Am I unmuted? Can you hear me? Now we can hear you, yes. Right. Um, yeah, I'm gonna go right to the, to the police. I think, you know, when when you look at the challenges surrounding towns are having, like Newport or Franklin, you know those challenges aren't getting farther away; they're getting closer to us. Um, and so, I think when I think about a particular department that needs our support and needs uh, our encouragement and our commitment, I believe it's the police department. 
Um, I know I want to live in a safe community, and I'm sure that my son wants, my wife wants to live in a safe community. So I would, I would definitely put uh, the emphasis on the police department. Thank you, uh, Charles Kelsey. Um, I I do not have an opinion on a department that is underfunded because I don't have the expertise or the knowledge to infer that it is or is not. I believe that a budget <clears throat> and the responsibility of the members of the committee is, its function primarily is to ensure that whatever the needs are as defined by all of the inputs are properly um, accounted for and, and frankly um, scrutinized to the extent that they make sense. So I would bring that objective thinking and process to the work that I would put towards uh, what the budget committee does. Thank you, Michael Williams. Uh, no, I, th I think that the, I think that we have done a pretty good job of meeting the re the requests of the department heads. Um, you know, the guys <laughs> in the transfer station work pretty hard. I think it probably use some help, but by and large, I think we've done a pretty good job. John Wilson? I agree. Uh, I think that uh, that our town has been very kind and, and very uh, supportive of all our departments. And, yeah. uh, and I leave it with that. Okay, very good. Thank you. All right, we're going to start the, uh, the next question with uh, Lou Boda. I'm sorry. Lou? Um, well, um, I can tell you as far as the, you know, departments that, you know, these should be funding a bit, but it may not necessarily have to do with funding. And I'm looking at first responders, not only police, but look at the fire department. We have a fire department that is aging out. And one of the reasons why it's aging out is because of the lack of workforce housing and affordable housing in London. We have a primarily volunteer fire department. Where are we going to get those young men and women to be part of the fire department? If we don't, if they can, if they do not live in the London, they're going to be volunteering in Wilmot. They're going to be volunteering in Sunapi. They're going to be volunteering in Newbury, but not in the London. So it, it behooves us to have the appropriate workforce housing and the, and the, the affordable housing necessary to make sure that we have younger people coming in who are going to fill the ranks of those volunteer positions and not only volunteer positions with, with, with first response, they're volunteer positions in every facet of our living. Right now I'm having a situation. We do have a, uh, a CERT, a um, community emergency response team and people who are extremely dedicated, but there's a dearth of young people. Why? Because they cannot live in New London. As long as we maintain that position, we are going to reach a point. Uh, we we're going to we're going to reach critical mass to a point that we may end up having to become a town with a professional fire department that is going to be, that is going to be incredibly expensive. Thank you, John Cannon. Um, no, I think I want to agree with Mike that I think overall the. Um, departments have been funded at their pretty much at their requested level and um, over the in the recent years we've actually probably given the police department uh, mo almost all of the resources that they've um, requested and um, started some capital reserve funds to give them some more equipment the chief has been very um, active in, in seeking uh, grants um, in fact there's a new one now new grant that just came out to uh, for the cameras and uh, body armor and things like that. So um, overall, I think we're doing a good job of um, funding the, the departments at the at the needed levels. Um, of course, everybody always wants more, but given the uh, fiscal restraints, and also have to I want to call out on the state for the you know their lack of support. Um, you know, we can't even get anything. They we lost the option to. Um, Increase the vehicle excise tax from five to ten dollars. Um, you know that was uh, denied in the in the last legislative session, and you know that and that's a excise tax is actually a a big 
part of the uh, the revenue stream for this town. So um, yeah, overall, I think the uh, departments are funded adequately. Lou is right about the problems for the uh, future problems for the uh, fire department, um, it, just because, and it's not just housing, there's a lot of demographic issues, even the career departments are having the, facing the same demographic issues, and, and, and social norms where people just don't want to do that type of work anymore. So um, there are a lot of uh, problems that are beyond just dollars and cents. Thank you. All right, next question with uh, Charles Kelsey. Uh, and uh, we might as well start on the uh, the housing questions. Uh, how should the town deal with the current housing shortage? <clears throat> it's, I don't know the answer, um, but I will give you my opinion and I would want it to be <clears throat> more informed by the committees that have done this work. Uh, this is not an unusual problem uh, in terms of unique, I should say, to New London, as we all know. Um, housing uh, takes on the, the question of supply and cost. <clears throat> and I, I really feel strongly that we need to come up with a solution that will encourage um, affordability, because with affordability, um, I think it addresses, it can address availability as long as it's a, an appropriate mix. I, I, I think the role the budget committee has is to take the input of the options generated from the building committee and the land committee to uh, quantify what is the actual cost associated with it? What are the potential revenue sources that can be used other than simply tax dollars uh, to, uh, to fund it. And that's, uh, that's an approach I think is, uh, the responsibility of the committee. And I would, uh, I would endorse and work hard to uh, fulfill. Michael Williams. Michael Williams. There we point. go. Sorry. Um, I'm sorry. The, the question is, is workforce housing, correct? Not, not. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't think this 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 is a problem that is going requires a private public um, partnership to solve. Um, I don't think that certainly the, the it's a big problem. Um, you know, the, the private sector needs needs some help from the town, um, but I don't think the town can do it by itself. Um, we do have to um, work together, and it is not easily solved. This is a um, I'm real familiar with, with the source. Um, I was actually um, in high school when the zoning laws were, that we currently have were passed. Um, it was, you know, the nature of that, the town was driven very much towards, um, you know, few um, large single family homes. Um, there was very little um, desire at that time for um, multifamily dwellings and, um, and it was terribly successful. So we kind of were, victim, were victims of our own success. And um, I think, you know, part of the, um, you know, the work, workforce housing problem that we now have is, is kind of an unintended, unintended consequence of the, uh, what we did back then. Um, you know, it's solvable, but I think it's going to require, um, you know, a, a lot of work um, from both the employers um, working in, in collaboration um, with the, the uh, groups in, in town that are working on it. John Wilson. Oh, it's interesting that that question is asked. I, I it's one that I uh, personally give a lot of thought to, but in re relation to the budget committee, which is a review of the budget that is uh, put together by department heads in the selectmen. I'm not sure that it's in our purview as to uh, uh, how we're gonna solve the uh, uh, affordable or workforce, I prefer the workforce housing uh, situation. So I, I, I don't see that it's a budget committee item until presented to them. Okay. 
Um, the uh, I do believe um, that you know there is a, a difference between the workforce housing and affordable housing. Um, in workforce housing, it's it, you know housing for all the occupations in every community, including teachers, the nurses, police, firefighters, and many other critical workers. However, uh, I do agree with John. Um, you know, it is something that the budget committee itself, you know, right as you know, from its from its uh, charter itself, we cannot um, we cannot make it as their number one priority or established policy. That's for somebody else. Um, however, we can we can still gently prod and seek consensus uh, to look at the policymakers that can uh, that can affect change in in regard to those policies, and and I think we should. Uh, and, and it's not saying it's you know overstepping our bounds or overstepping the charters that are that are crafted by the uh, by statute it is something that we as members of the community uh, especially in positions of responsibility um, owe to each department head to support them in in and uh, in our committees in town to support them in the um, their endeavors according you know to make sure that we do have housing for our people okay. John Cannon um, I agree that it the the whole issue is not necessary under the um, purview of the uh, budget committee. Um, but and I would just point out a couple of things on this work. It was a very very viable project for workplace housing um, several years ago, and I went I went to the public hearing on it, and I was just shocked at the amount of support for it as well as long as it was somewhere else in town. Um, I think the term is NIMBY, not in my backyard, and and then just a, a broader societal uh, point that I would like to make is that for, for many years we all had affordable housing and many of us grew up where um, one one parent worked, the, the other the spouse stayed home, and oftentimes you were able to have the house out in the suburbs and you had two cars and even found money to um, maybe buy a cottage or a camp up at the lake. And, and that's certainly not the case now. You have two people working and sometimes two or three jobs just to afford a house. So it's a much broader issue than just um, g getting some housing built. So, um, but that's be way beyond the uh, issues of the, uh, the budget committee. It's, it's just as much a wage problem as it is a uh, housing problem. Art? Yeah, I, I guess, you know, my comment on workforce housing is, like I said earlier, I think the first step is we need to find the land. And I think we need to take some action on finding land first. Um, and then we can discuss what we're going to do with that land. Is it workforce housing? Is it conservation land? And that's up to the, to the community to decide. Um, I do feel that um, workforce housing definitely benefits the college. I think it definitely would benefit our hospital in town. Um, so I see, you know, I see the benefits of workforce housing, but I think the first step is really figuring out where that property is and making that commitment. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, we, the next question is going to start with uh, Michael Williams. And the question is, uh, what is your plan for New London past your possible term in office and over the next five or 10 years? What are the needs you see and how would you see the budget meeting these needs? Wow, small problem, small question. <laughs> um, I think the planning process is, um, you know, dealing and pl planning for growth, I think, is the most important problem that I see. Um, the, 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 the town is not designed um, to grow quickly. <laughs> it's just, it's not. And um, there's lots of pressures on, on the, you know, there are more pressures on growth now than I've seen um, before in my lifetime. So the planning process is, is important. And, um, you know, the work that the committees are doing are more important than they ever were. 
Um, and those really are, I mean, that's really where I, where I see the issues. We're, we're in such good shape compared to the, the surrounding towns. It's really remarkable. Um, so that's, that's what I see as, as being the, the real challenge in front of us. Thank you, John Wilson. Well, uh, this is almost like the last question. Uh, I think we're we're getting into stuff that is uh, is beyond the uh, specific purview of the budget committee. Uh, five years out, ten years out. Uh, again, we are pretty much a review process uh, to the uh, to the budget system. Although the budget is ours in the long run. But uh, the idea that we're going to do the long-term planning for the town, uh, uh, it, it, it's not, it's not uh, in our charter at all. Okay. Uh, Lou, photo. Yeah, I, I do believe, you know, like, you know, uh, like I'll, I'll agree with John, but, you know, we do have a charter and the charter is established by statute. What, it, what towns that have, uh, voted to have a budget committee as a part of the budget too. And, and while we need to stick in our lane, uh, nonetheless, we are able to, because we're all, you know, in the budget committee, they're all town leaders. Uh, they should all bring their competence to seek consensus among other leaders to make sure that the problems of this town are properly solved and, and reach consensus to solve these problems. Um, and of course, you know, you have everything, you know, from affordable housing to an station to whatever, but again, where the budget committee's, you know, charter is to make sure that there is a transparency and the accountability and the, uh, the permanence of, of, um, uh, you know, common sense in the budget planning. Okay, thank you. Uh, John Cannon. Well, I, as, um, well, being on the budget committee, you know, for however long, but I would hope that the budget committee is looking the long term and not just for the, the, the current budget budget year or or their own term. I, I would hope that the um, that they you know push the department heads to make sure that you know future um, or potential um, repairs or uh, planning improvements that um, they. Pri uh, to, you know, provide a, a hefty price tag are being uh, funded through our capital reserve fund. That, so we are putting the money away um, for the future, knowing that, um, you know, sewer mains and uh, sidewalks, things like that are going to, are going to need replaced. Heavy equipment um, is, you know, will be need, need to be replaced at building, um, things like that. So I would hope that the budget committee takes a long-term view of when they start recommending uh, a budget to, so to know that it's just, hey, let's just, let's just get through this year. And then, and then all of a sudden, a couple of years later, you know, down the road, now we've got a big sticker shock because there's a, been some emergency or uh, something that just needs immediate replacement. So um, that's my view of it, whether what the budget committee does is not just the current budget year, but start looking at out five, 10, even 20 years to knowing what's gonna to need to be replaced. And I think that's one of the valuable, most valuable things that the Building and Facilities Committee is, uh, has done is to start identifying assets and when things are gonna to need to be um, replaced. You know, How long are you gonna get out of a roof or a, um, a boiler or things like that? So um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, Mark Christensen? Um, you know, I'm really encouraged with the upcoming study of Main Street. I think, um, you know, when I think about five years from now, what our town could look like, um, what, you know, impact that will have on our businesses on Main Street, uh, the positive impact that will have on families that enjoy walking on those sidewalks, um, parking issues. Um, so I'm really encouraged. I'm really looking forward to the, the results of that, uh, that study. Charles, Charles Kelsey? Um, I think there's a master plan that's been developed. I think that's a guidepost. A lot of hard work's gone into that. And a capital improvement plan that has also been identified uh, that would serve as the guidance over the next five to 10 years. 
I agree with John Wilson and others who have commented that the purview of the budget committee <clears throat> is not establishing the five to 10 year plan. It is to do the rigorous work to ensure that first of all, that a budget is put together with sound assumptions, that it makes sense, um, and that we have a responsibility of due diligence. Um, what was does not necessarily mean it should be. Uh, I believe we're at an inflection point as a town, as we are as a state, as we are as a country. We just cannot keep uh, paying for everything because we want it. I think we have to be really deliberate uh, in determining need and prioritizing accordingly. And the budget committee's responsibility is to work with town leadership to appropriately quantify it and make sure that it's right, it's sound and it's appropriate in the interest of the taxpayer. Okay, we're uh, going to do our, our closing statements now. And I just uh, like to thank each of you gentlemen uh, as you uh, aspire, as you say, to become one of the town leaders, I thank you for entertaining questions on a wide variety of issues which have been sent in by the voters and uh, not limiting yourself uh, in sharing your opinions. So we're going to begin with closing statements and we'll start in the, uh, the end of the alphabet now with John Wilson. Ah. <laughs> Well, again, thank you, <laughs> Pat, and thank you, the League of Women Voters, for this opportunity. Uh, I'd like to reiterate that I have lived here for 51 years, and I've practiced dentistry here for 32 years, and I was a member of the Budget Committee 2004 to 2016, and I was a chair of that committee for th those years. In closing, I'm only going to repeat what I've said in my ads, and that is I'm familiar with all New London town departments, with exception of uh, uh, the emergency management and the way the budget is determined and how it works. I believe that any expenditure the town makes should be to satisfy a well-defined need and should both add real value to and maintain real value for the town. I will add that as long as inflation remains high, budget preparation is going to be more challenging, requiring more sensitivity by the committee. I pledge to studiously prepare for and to attend all budget committee related meetings. If what I have described here appeals to you, please consider voting for me, John Wilson on March 8th. And as I said before, I love this place. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michael Williams. Um, well, I want to thank everyone who's still listening to the call an hour and a half later for hanging in there. Um, uh, I also want to thank the voters of the town for allowing me to serve on the budget committee uh, last term, and I hope for the opportunity to do it again. Thank you. Charles Kelsey. Well, um, I want to thank John Wilson, first of all, because he was my dentist. You may not remember me, but he was. <laughs> Um, I am um, honored to be considered, frankly. I think I can add value. I'm new, meaning I really don't have an opinion. I don't have an agenda. I have energy. I'm a hard worker. I believe in preparation and, um, and work to get to preparation. I've got pretty sound experience and I have opinions, but I think they're informed opinions uh, from a, a very long, successful career. I'd be honored to serve, and I hope I could do it well for this town. Thank you. Mark Christensen? Excuse Mark, me. Oh, closing oh. statement? Yep, thank you, everyone. Um, yeah, I just want to really emphasize that um, over the last 20 years, I've uh, really made the commitment to serve this community. Um, I'm a family man. Um, and I think it's really, really important for uh, the budget committee to have representation of all voices. Um, and so I really would appreciate your vote, vote on March 8th. Thank you very much. John Cannon. Well, I want to thank uh, Patricia for, uh, and the league for uh, sponsoring this. Like I said, this is a very valuable um, 
platform, um, especially given the circumstances out there with the um, pandemic and everything else. So um, I want to thank also thank the uh, voters who uh, supported me during my run and term in the um, selectmen. I also want to thank the colleagues on the board of selectmen for their um, advice and uh, discussion and um, so and support. So the, the the reason I, again, appreciate the uh, budget committee, and I think somebody mentioned it before, and we've heard a lot about, um, you know, data-driven stuff, and that's, that is, you know, certainly a, a factor, but in government, where you have people that have wants and needs, we need to be able to do it, and I think that through my experience, I have a very good sense of what, what the committee, what the community is, you know, is wants and what they will accept and um and also how to balance the the quantitative needs and the um it, along with the um the quantitative um needs the the biggest part of the budget is is our labor our workforce and human resources that's no matter what we do the only way you're going to be able to really make any uh, cuts or in the budget is through um, is positions and, and then it's service cuts. So um, I recognize that to, despite all the, you know, the plant and everything, the biggest um, asset we have is our workforce. And so I think to try and balance all those needs of the actual equipment and tools they need, along with getting the right people in the right position is a big part of the budget. And as I said, with my experience, both government over 40 years and just being on the budget committee and the selectmen is that balancing all those uh, needs and wants is the uh, thing. And I have believe I have the experience and I would encourage people to uh, vote for me for the budget committee. So thank you again. Thank you. And Lou Boda. Thank you very much. I, again, I, I wanted to uh, thank the League of Women Voters for, for staging this, um, you, know, you know, this town hall basically because there's so many, so many people listening. Uh, but I wanted to make um, the point that our town, uh, when you look at the fact that there are nine people uh, as candidates for the budget committee, there is a tremendous amount of energy positive energy in this town. The way that we channel it, the way that we manage it, is the way that our town is going to go into the future. Um, what we have in our town is resources, people, and the optimism and the energy required to make sure that we have a civil society that where everyone feels welcome with a high quality of life and with the with a high morale in both people and employees. Uh, the budget committee, because of its charter in not only reviewing, but also recommending and having to do with the budget um, is an integral part of that fabric of the town. And that's why I'm interested in becoming part of it. And I do have the experience. Um, you know, I was in Arlington, Virginia. Again, it was a, uh, it's now almost a billion dollar budget for the, for the, for the town. Basically, it's a, it's a uh, county slash town. Uh, and we are privileged to have way less issues. But nonetheless, they are as important as the next. So I'd like to use my experience to benefit our wonderful town to make sure that it goes forward in the future is probably is the best town to live in the United States. Thank you. I'd like to thank all the candidates who appeared tonight, all the voters who sent in their uh, questions, all the viewers that we have, and uh, remind you that uh, this will be broadcast on Yankee Cable Network on uh, Sunday at uh, 12 and 6 p.m. So if you missed any part of it or you want to see it again, it'll be on then. On behalf of the link, we League of Women Voters, we thank you very much and have a pleasant evening. Good night. Thank you, Matt. Thank, thank you, you. Elliot.